Okay. I see you're getting content. I see you're getting content. Oh, I better get my. Uh... It's like there's some echo. That was me. I had the uh, live stream going. I want to see when you actually turned it on. Cool. I have now muted that though, so there shouldn't be echo anymore. Mm. I guess when people are talking, I'll mute people if needed. For example, right now I'm muting you, Luther. Is it me for sure that's doing it? Now let's see. Actually, yeah, I don't know where that audio is actually coming from. Yeah, I don't know where that. <laughs> Maybe it's you. Maybe it's me. Hold on. Maybe it's you got a you got a tab open with that YouTube stream? Let me try now. Hola. Does it sound better now? It does. What'd you do? It's turned off my uh one second, let me get my uh Mike. So we'll be starting in about 30 seconds. Be right back. Awesome. Hello, everybody. I am switching my audio last second. Okay. Little audio check. How is everything? I don't think there's an echo anymore. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Is there an echo when I is because I have a big mic here. I can put my headset on too if you need, but I don't think there's an echo anymore. I don't hear anything. Yeah, I, I think we're good now. Cool. Okay. So welcome to TGIK. It is uh the twenty eighth. <clears throat> and so we're gonna go through um a bunch of stuff related to images today, right? So we've got James is here, my my friend from Microsoft, and he's a Windows Windows guy. And actually, Luther is here too, um, over from Rancher. So thanks for coming to hang out. And um, so let's start out with the um, with the weekend review here. And of course, I'm Jay. You all know who I am. So. Um, the first thing, let's see. Hi, Turkey. We got Turkey. We got Tim. Hey, what's up, Tim? What's up, Rory? Robert. Hi. Okay. Hey, Eric. Yeah, let's just let's let's. <laughs> yeah, your weekend's almost here. What's up? What's up, Jiri from India? Cool. All right, we got a lot of people showing up. Yeah. Um. So, let's start out and start looking at the news. Let's see what's going on. So make a separate browser for this and uh, just yell at me if uh, if anything's too big or too small. First thing that uh, we've got here is, re so 
So this, this week uh, is uh, using Kubernetes to rethink your system architecture and ease technical debt. So what do we got here? So talking about Ansible playbooks and managing EC2 instances like pets. So this sounds like a before after story. So what happened? Um, a no new infrastructure. So the purpose built for our problem. So it looks like the story here is, I guess the, to me, the interesting thing about this is it's funny. We think that everybody's already moved on to Kubernetes, but most people haven't. And every, you know, the world still lives really in a lot of people on VMs. Um, and so for folks that are evaluating K8s and trying to figure out a way to get into it, to this whole system, this might be a really good article to read. It's uh, on the Stack Overflow blog. Um, next one, next thing we've got in the weekend review here is uh, Pine. I think this is a rancher thing. Right, kind is not at CD. This is, this is really cool. Um, is this the thing, Luther? Tell me about this. Uh, so this is the thing that powers K threes. Um, it was originally uh, it was Darren's idea to get rid of at CD and uh, shim in SQ Lite. Uh, we've added more to it. Um, if you go into package, there's some place in there. There's going to be a driver section, so you can see there's Postgres and a bunch of other stuff now. Um, but it was it was kind of like how can you get to it, etcd always kind of was the you know the grill in the room always need a lot of resources and Darren always wanted to make stuff more edge compatible so K3s was his idea to do that with SQ Lite so that it was a uh, no kind of all that stuff that was coming with an etcd your rafts and whatever else it's like none of that stuff he really cared for a single node sitting on the edge in a Raspberry Pi or whatever so. He stripped out all the yeah. etcd stuff and essentially made a bunch of, you know, SQL. So calls. he implemented, yeah, because you can, you know, there's a data class in upstream, yeah. right? So exactly. if you go in there, there's a, if we go into KK, where is it? It's, of course, we. I don't want to spend too much time in this, but in in 10 seconds, can you tell me where that interface is so we can show people? No, I didn't do any of this work. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't okay. tell you. So if, if like, folks want a cool homework assignment, dig through KK, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, and try to find where the data interface for etcd is. It's somewhere in here. You know, Tim St. Clair knows where that is. Um, but he's, I don't know if he's here today, but he, he, was, the, he was the guy who originally wrote it. So um, there's an interface and you can implement the interface. So, yeah. all right, let's jump out of here and go to, uh, I wanted to talk about, I don't know, does anybody raise your hands or shout out um, TGI case. Oh, TGI case slash notes doesn't show the correct page. I think. Wow. Thank you for noting that. So let me give you this one right here and, uh, let me try to fix that. TGI K TGI K dot IO slash notes. Thank you so much for noticing that. Um, Oh, interesting. It's like we have two. <laughs> it's like I created a markdown and that was not the same one. So let's switch. Let me switch this over to here. And then, yeah. Okay. So let me update the markdown. So, okay. So are y'all, you all happy now? We got the right, we're doing the right thing now. Okay. Here we go. That should be better. Okay. So if folks want to let me know if they got the right thing now, um, let me know. Okay, cool. Yeah. And well, thank you for jumping in here. So yeah. Uh, thank you. Whoever noticed that M Morteza Husseini. Um, and, and so, all right, we got the notes. So, uh, do you all remember last episode? So this is real cool. Thanks for that. Uh, Luther. I, a lot of people talking about that whole thing. Like, can we just not use that CD? So um, we uh, over on the ping project, a couple of episodes, we were showing you the next generation kube proxy. And if you all remember, I couldn't get it working when we found out why the reason why 
was because uh, NF tables and IP tables conflict. And so there's a bunch of articles and stuff about this, but it turns out that there's like a legacy IP tables um, sort of to deal with this whole thing. And it's like renamed and um, in newer versions of Ubuntu, this is fixed and so on and so forth. Um, so, but NF tables and IP tables kind of, they don't play nicely together, right? Because NF tables is the new thing and IP tables is the old thing. And so um, there's a lot of stuff in NF tables that we're sort of resolving. But if you anybody wants to try Kaping out and go into the um, the local the uh, local up Kaping recipes and try out the next gen Kube proxy, we now have support for IPVS and IP tables to test it out. And uh, Mikhail also added node ports to it. So we're getting there. We're getting getting closer. Um, and uh, so. Sorry about not being able to get it to work last time, but we'll do another TGIK and dig, dig into it again soon. But um, so James, you've got some interesting news on the uh, AKS side, right? Yeah, so um, it's been a long time in, in coming, but uh, we've got Containerd support for Windows Server and Preview now. Um, this opens up a lot of new uh, functionality for Windows containers being able to single mount uh, files uh, it has the host process. It'll enable host process uh, containers when they come, uh, which just landed in 122. And um, there's a bunch of other awesome features for Containerd for Windows. So uh, it's a big one. Um, we had our build uh, when Microsoft had its build this week. So there's a lot of announcements, but this is the one that's exciting for me from a Windows Kubernetes guy. So yeah, that's exciting for me too because we have. Container D on the way over with uh, with uh, over at VMware Tanzu. We've got it on the way very 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 soon as well for Windows um, based on Cluster API. Um, now we've got increment.containers. So I don't know what this is. This issue shares practical considerations functional processes containerization. So this is another really good sort of CIO, I guess, level sort of. Um, or may, yeah, like why why you want to move to Kubernetes kind of at a large scale. So this is, is this a book or is this a, um, I mean, this is one of the most nicely created sort of introductions to um, this whole ecosystem that I've ever seen, this increment.about. So increment.about, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, I guess uh, how teams and build teams build and operate software systems at scale. So it's kind of just a good, okay, cool. So we got that and um, now we get into it. Okay, so uh, we've got a lot of image-based topics today. So um, if anybody has any questions about containers or images or anything else, feel free to just dump them in the, <laughs> dump them in the chat. I don't know if I can answer them. It's not like I know everything, um, but I don't know. We got a few other people here that are pretty smart um, that might be able to answer stuff. I have not dug super deep into the um, the way CRI and OCI and stuff works. So this has been kind of fun for me playing around with it in the last couple hours to try to make sure that we had something cool to show you. But um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off and we're going to start with uh, AGN host. Okay. And then me and James will show you some stuff related to Image Builder, OVAs, VHDs, how those are built. Um, uh, um, and then I'm, I'm going to put this down here. This is like, I'm going to put this stuff up here so it's easier to sort of organize it in our heads here. Um, yeah, this is where the, this is where the Kublet stuff starts. And this is KK. So AGN host. So do does anybody in the audience know what AGN host is? Does anybody wanna 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 contribute their their knowledge of upstream KK to this podcast or 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 live stream before I tell you what it is? Um, so let's go to Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Okay. And let's go to it on Git. I'll just, you know, I can go straight to it, AGN host. Yeah, I can go straight to it. So, um, hi, Sevi. Nice to nice to see you here. Um, 
Happy TGIK to you too. So AGN host is it's 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 a container that we use in upstream K8s to um, to test things. And um, I you can you can Docker run it. I think I have I think I have it somewhere around here. I think I have it in one of these terminals floating around. Um, so yeah, if you look in here, actually, so if I do, so AGN host is, is, um, yeah, we can just, we can literally run it right now. It's a, it's a container that's agnostic to the operating system, which is why we're doing it in this stream. Cause this stream is all about images and how they work on different environments and how you can run them in different environments, not just the standard traditional Linux K8s sort of environment that we're, we're all used to. And you know, one of the best examples of this is is AGN host because you know for the for the for the Kubernetes end to end tests, we have to test. You know, we've got thousands of tests. We've got you know five six what four five thousand tests, and you know the thing is that you've got to like, you've got to be able to run these tests not only on Linux but on Windows too, right? So each one of these, if you go into test E two E, right, you'll see we've got like Windows tests. We've got all these tests in here. We've got, um, you know, we've got a bunch of tests for SIG network. Obviously, most of these, um, or a lot of these, are most commonly exercised on Linux and so on and so forth. But we need to be able to run on multiple operating systems. So the solution to this is the AGN host. And that the AGN host does is, if I go back, where is it? Where do we go? Oh, where'd I go? Here it is. Yeah, it has all these different programs in it, right? And each one of these, right? Um, each one of these is actually compiled in a way that they work on both uh, Linux and Windows. So this code is kind of like cross compatible. And so the the way this all works, right? And so like you can just, so, and so you can play around with this, right? And each one of these, we'll, we'll look at a couple of these, right? But like what we do, the way the end to end tests work is that um, they, you know, we create deployments and the deployments uh, or, or daemon sets or whatever. And, you know, then we test certain things. Like, for example, we'll test that one pod can talk to another. We'll test that a pod can mount a persistent volume, all that stuff. And so, you know, if I if I was to, so each one of these little cross-platform programs, I can just test them in my, in Docker here, right? Like I can just, I can just run this here in my, in my, in my, in Docker without Kubernetes. And it's, it's serving on this port and, um, so it's got that. It's got all these other little tiny little cross-platform programs that I can run and play around with. So the default is pause, right? It just does nothing. Um, uh, let's see. I don't know. Like, what's the? <laughs> I guess. I guess the way to find these is. I don't know. Like, does it have a? I don't know. Like, maybe we don't have a. I thought that AGN host maybe had a help command, but maybe it doesn't. Oh yeah, it does. Sorry, I just wasn't looking properly. So here's all the commands that it's got, all the little sort of cross-platform things it can do, right? So um, I can run guestbook, I can run light, I can run. So like we use, for example, as an example here, we use we use this quite a bit in SIG network, right? Um, for, for various tests, right? It starts a little tiny web server and it allows you to ping each other for to see whether one thing can talk to another, um, we use net exec pretty ex pretty extensively because um, we we use these and uh, we use net exec in the in the network policy tests. Um, as I recall, let me confirm that actually while we're here because I don't want to lie to you here. But uh, let me see. So if I um, if I cd to source go source. Uh, Wait, CD source Kubernetes. Make my screen bigger. Uh, yeah, if I go in here and I get grep for image, all right, grep dash r image dot slash. Oh, uh, test e two e network. Net, net ball. Make sure. Um, yeah, so here's, here's where we use, here's where we call out AGN host, um, in, in, uh, in these tests. And we could see if I go in here, my AGN host, we call it and actually, no, we actually use serve host name. So, so we use surf serve host name and then we use, we use, I guess, Porter over here. So we, we call these particular programs here and we spin up 
like a TCP endpoint, a UDP endpoint, depending on what kind of policies we're trying to test and so on and so forth. So these are very extensively used right throughout the code base. And anyway, so yeah, this is the way, this is where they're built. And um, if we go back here, we'll see that there's a Docker file and there's a Docker file windows. And actually James knows the Docker file windows parts better, better than I do. Uh, but James, uh, we were just talking about this actually a little while ago. Um, where was, uh, I have it in the, in the URLs here. Um, we were just talking about the pause image, actually. That's, that's actually the, the pause images. So, so these are all the test images. And then I, I think the next thing we wanted to talk about was the pause image. So everybody knows about the pause image. Um, it's anytime you run any container, um, you, you fire off one of these, right? Um, it sort of sits around until your Linux network namespace comes up. And if you look in the pause image, the way the pause image is built, there's a Docker file and then a Docker file for Windows, right? And so these have separate, um, th this is, these have separate, um, separate build patterns in them. And um, so if you look in the Docker file for Windows, right, this actually, uh, this doesn't require, this doesn't require a Windows Server. Um, it require you can run this on Linux. And I just found this out this morning from Claudio and James. But uh, James, you want to talk them through this bit of drama over here? Yeah. So this, one of, one of the things actually, I think Dim's worked some on this. I tried to tried to get Dim's to stop in, but he's busy today. But anyways, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, we initially did was you had to have a Windows Server to build all of the test images, uh, and that was challenging because the Windows Server you have to have a one per version. Um, and so we had Linux VMs and they would connect out to the Windows Docker host and build the images, but it was just expensive and challenging to maintain. And so um, Claudio, Claudio um, who's in SIG Windows, kind of started to figure out that you could actually use BuildX to build Windows container images, as the, but there's just a few caveats. So like you can't do run commands um, and um, there's a couple other small things, but the run commands is the big one. And so uh, we actually build all of the Windows container test images on Linux using BuildX. So um, you can you can boot up your Linux machine, run build, and they build all the images and push them all up to uh, GCR. Cool. Yeah. So so to like sort of try to try to put some so, to sort of visualize the way this sort of works. Um, let me. Yeah. So. So with BuildX, um, like how do you? I don't know how to how to start. So it's it's kind of like, I guess BuildX was built. Was it built specifically for multi arch? Was that? I guess that's why it was built, right? Because you have Windows, you have Linux, but you have different. You have x86. You've got ARM. You've got all these different, and each one of these might require you know a different type of like architecture. So I guess that's kind of the reason like BuildX was sort of sort of created from from like the Docker team, right? And then um, it allows you to build any any architecture. So if you go and you look, so people, for example, that ship the pause image, you know, and you know who has a great blog post on this is Pere. Let's we can go pull his up. The where is it? Um by the way, I don't know if I interrupted you, but <laughs> keep going if I interrupted you. Um, Perry, here it is. Yeah. Perry has an awesome blog post on this. I don't know if this is how, yeah. Um, so, and you all build your own, you all build your own pause images probably this way also, right? Over at Rancher and Microsoft and stuff, I assume, right? I mean, I assume you do something very similar to this. Um, yeah, we use the same upstream scripts. Uh, the only difference for Windows in particular is we sign all the the scripts and things that get pushed into them. Yeah. So if you if you look at a container, right? If you look into a container, it's got these manifests, right? If you look into an OCI container, so OCI is the container interface, right? That that everything runs off of since whenever it was created as the alternative to just running Docker images, right? It's a, like a, a a an, an unbranded container runtime interface, right? So any anybody can write their own container runtime. And, you know, to conform to that, you have to, you know, make these these manifests. And then these manifests inside of them have have information about the architecture, right? So you've got 
um, you've got the architecture, right? And you have like a, you know, you have an image and the image has, you know, a one to many uh, relationship with this, with, the, with architecture, right? This is your OCI image. And um, so you have, so you can have all these different architectures and sort of OS, I guess these, you might call these like OS architecture tuples, or I guess these are called platform, right? So it has like many platforms, right? So one, one of these has many platforms. And, and so every image you have is, is structured this way. And, um, and then if you, if you look in here, for example, when you run the pause image, right, um, you have, uh, yeah, and build kit has, yep. See, I'm learning how to use these little bubbles where I can like make everybody pop up. So yeah, one of build kits features is multi arch, right? So, um, so enter, so, so Perry's little article here just was just about to get into that, right? So, um, the way that you, the way that you ship distribute cube is, you, you've got to give people a pause image. You just have to give people pause. You can't do anything without it. It's it's like it's so fundamental. It's an input to the kubelet, right? The kubelet. I mean, it, to the you know, in kube ADM, when you I think when you install kube ADM, you even tell it the pause image. Um, and uh, so, where is our little? Here's how you do it, right? So 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 you you basically wind up creating this sort of loop. And what you do is when you in when you build your image, you actually use BuildX to build it for all these different architectures, right? Right, which is done right here. And then you kind of append the manifest list, right? So you add add these entries up here, right? And then each one of these entries <clears throat> winds up getting pulled down by your container runtime. So as an example to see how that works, right? If I was to, you know, try to run a IIS image, right? Um, like, let's go in here. Like, I'm on a Linux machine. Uh, yeah, if I try to run an IIS image, all right, let's say I tried to run this, right? So, if I tried to docker run dash t dash i this image, uh, you see how it blows up instantly, right? It says there's no manifest for that Linux AMD 64 image, right? So, um, because it's it's a it's a Microsoft uh, IIS image that's meant to be run for like Windows containers, right? Whereas, you know, actually I could jump into that IIS image. I think I actually have it in one of these over here. Like I could jump in here and it runs fine on, on Windows. So this is the same image and you could see in here, right? Um, I can kubectl get pods kubectl edit pod and I can see this image here and I got the same image here and it runs just fine on a, on but that's because I have nodes show wide I have a windows cluster I have a windows node here windows server 2019 right so like you know same 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 container totally different life experience depending on what what planet you put it on and um so yeah, next, holy, holy, what did he say? Holy, yeah, I think we, yes, you can run. That's, yeah, you know, a lot of people run IIS. It's no joke, man. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. You know what, 80% of the world or so, I don't know what it is, but, you know, a lot, a lot of Windows deployments out there. So this is important. Um, you, uh yeah, I think what's what's cool about that the the, the multi arch manifest that you're showing off with the different versions is that um, A and G host container that same URL you can go and to your Windows machine and you can run the same exact um, image name there and it will mm -hmm. pull down the correct one based based off of those OS platform um, yeah values which is really cool because now you just build you just can distribute that single URL. And every, anybody can pull it on all the different OSs as long as it's in that manifest list. Yeah, exactly. So like this would be able to schedule on this node and this over here would be able to schedule on this node if this was my K8s cluster. And it's the same container. It's the exact same OCI image, right? So well, that's the cool... What's that? So, so I don't know if it's the same OCI image. It's the, the, it's the same oh, OCI yeah. manifest it's list. Same, yeah. And that those link out to the correct 
in like containers that that would run. So um, it's just like a, a list of like, hey, if you match this, go pull this particular image, go pull this image. Yeah, yeah that's true. So it's this, right? It's it's a separate, it's a, it's the same build, it's a separate image, right? So, and and it's this manifest that gives you this. Now I have a question though. The OCI manifest for multi arch, um, the OCI. So like, I guess this is always. Is this only in the two spec? This whole thing, or does this work with the OCI one spec also? Because I only have seen this in the two spec, but I never looked at the one spec. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know yeah, specifically. I, yeah, so I don't know how long, but I. So I mean, and the only reason I ask that is I'm just wondering: is this always been the case um, that we've had this? But anyways, it is. That's a really important thing, like what James mentioned, because like it's it's subtle, and you may have missed it. But in here, when we build this, right, we're doing this build X here, and we're appending to this manifest list. So you need this server like running to like maintain the state of this um, and append the state of all these different um, of all these different images here. Wait, why do they call these manifests? Like if these are manifests, then what is this <laughs> top level? Yeah, well, so also I, I think I might be using the wrong terms. Like Docker calls them manifest lists. Um, OCI, I think they call them something slightly different. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's pull up the OCI yeah, spec and see what what is the OCI spec. Let's see if we can find it here. So this thing, this high level thing that has the actual <laughs> the thing that has the things in it. Um, where is it? Doesn't it have a spec somewhere? It's got to have like a definition somewhere, right? Like, so there's a bundle. There's a is there a manifest? Oh, there's not a manifest. So there's a bundle. There's a config. Let's see. Before I posed the prior one, I had said build kit, build X, build kit is much more than multi arch. Uh, yeah. Um, Eric, do you want to? Um, elaborate on what 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 other parts you're interested in. i mean it's a lot i know it's a lot faster and it caches things and stuff like that but was there other stuff that you were thinking of um glossary let's go in here manifest it doesn't have a manifest in the glossary so if i was to clone this down i don't know i i well i'm, I'm interested in this but i I, in the interest of time, I think we should jump, but we should come back to this later. So, all right, let me get my scribble over to my other monitor so I don't have to look at it right now. And I can jump over to like, so we've gone through the pause, we've gone through the make file. Let's investigate image spec. Okay, you got it. Let's do that. Okay, we're back. So let's get this over here. Okay, let's look at the image spec. So Manifest OCI manifest. Oh wait, OCI GitHub. Here it is. Oh gosh, where did I go? OCI spec GitHub. Right. All right. So oh, there's an a runtime spec and an image spec. So those are separate uh, things. Um, yeah. Um, so you mentioned Suresh image spec. Um, so I went to the wrong one. Um, I'm really glad that you brought that up because like, this isn't, it wasn't obvious at all to me that there was two separate specs. <laughs> so maybe we'll find the manifest in here, right? Here it is manifest. Okay. So there's a runtime spec for those of you watching and a, uh, manifest. I'm back in the wrong image spec and a manifest. Uh, okay. And, and so the manifest is here. So unlike image index, which contains information about a set of images that can span a variety of architectures, an image manifest provides a configuration and a set of layers for a single container image for a specific operating system. Yeah. See, they, okay. they mix up the terminology between <laughs> like the Docker manifest and then yeah. the, the way the OCI says it. Okay. So. I always get those confused, but. Okay, so, but the way they're defining manifest is, um, 
it's a configuration and a set of layers for a single container image. So they are saying that if we go back to where's Pere, I don't, it's, I, I get so, I get so anxious when Pere isn't around. I just don't know what to do with myself. Where is it? Uh, where is his blog post? Here it is. Yeah. So they are saying that, yeah, each one of these, okay. And so then this top level thing is a Docker, man well, Perry's calling it a Docker manifest, but I don't know what we would call that top level thing. I guess, oh man, naming stuff is not easy, right? Um, because. Yeah, so in the, in the OCI spec, it's called a uh, image index an annotated index of image manifests. And then the image manifest in the OCI right. doc is the, hey, these are the layers that comprise this image. That's what um, it is. It's an image index. So we need to Docker put it. Calls, Docker calls that top level thing that points to a bunch of different types of images, uh, Docker manifest. Yeah. OK. So basically, this is the way this is all working, right? Is uh, Oh, I was drawing, and it wasn't there. So let me, here it is. Uh, there it is. So this is the way it's working then, is that we've got um, an image and an image index, and an image index has multiple manifests, right? And then each one of these manifests, um, each one of these manifests is, uh, is one of these things. And so when you pull down, when I run a pause image, my S container D is then going to be smart enough then to go based on what's in my Toml to go pull that down, right? So let's just look, let's just jump into that. And well, you know, we're thirty minutes in. I I kind of want to jump into that, but I feel like I feel like we're I feel like we need to we need to show you the other stuff. So we've looked at this. We can come back to this later if folks really want to see it. Just shout in the YouTube, and we'll jump in there and we'll look at the Toml files for container D on a windows or a, um, another host. Um, and it looks like we lost Luther. I don't know where Luther went. Um, but, um, thank you, Suresh for bringing that up. Um, yeah, Eric, definitely. Okay. Yep. Build next gen. Um, yeah. <laughs> build kit could, maybe that's another the next episode, Eric. So yeah, Eric, if you are like some kind of build kit expert and you want to, uh, to talk about that, reach off to reach out, you know, offline to me and, um, and maybe we can do one on that. Um, so my, you could just ping me whatever tw Twitter, if you want J unit 100, um, you could DM me if you want. Um, uh, so, uh, cool. What are we going to do now? Let me go back to my, speaking of manifests, let me go back to my manifest for this, for this lovely day. Um, where are we? Okay, here we go. There's a lot of stuff here, James. I don't know if we can get through it all. Here we go. Building Windows OVAs on OS X. So, um, yeah. So, so, so I, I'll just gonna quickly talk you, know, you through. Yeah. You you have uh, the OCI stuff down below where you're gonna unpack some of the images. You might just jump right to that since we were doing OCI. We can maybe squeeze oh. an image builder then. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could squeeze that in. Um, so, well, let's ask the audience. Do you all want to go deeper into OCI or do you want to see some some image builder building virtual machine stuff first and come back to OCI later? Does anybody have an opinion? If not, we'll go one step deeper on some, some container stuff. I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two. Nobody cares. Okay. <laughs> all right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, I think we're going to do James's idea. Let's try this out. So, um, yeah. So once you get into the business of, yeah, okay, we'll do it. We're going to go deep on the, okay, go deep says Suresh. Let's go deep in OCI. So, so you were right, James. So, um, the, the thing that happens when you start playing with images, the first in the is, is, is you, 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 you wind up needing to, um, you wind up needing and or wanting to like investigate them, pull them down. You might want to do this for your 
for security purposes, you might use a tool like Black Duck or something that goes and grabs images and 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 scans those images for uh, for vulnerabilities. Um, in fact, I don't know if this project still exists, but there was a project called Ophelia. Ophelia. Ophelia Black Duck software, which um, which did this. Uh, and I, I don't know where. I thought we had a link to it. I don't know. Maybe it's not there. Maybe it's not there anymore. Ophelia. Yeah, it's not there anymore. I'm not sure. This is a long time ago. There was an open source project um, related to this that actually had to use these sorts of tools to to pull these down and to pull images down and uh, sort of examine them. And so Scopio is a tool, which I think is, which is a really cool, nice tool to use for this. So Scopio allows you to, let's just, we can go back to the notes because I put the snippets in here. So Scopio allows you to like, sort of like pull down an image and I've already pulled down some of these. Um, it allows you to pull an image with no, you know, um, so for example, if I just go to temp and do this again, so I could show you like, it allows you to just pull down an image without having any kind of Docker dependency, right? So make your test one. I go in here and I could just scope you'll pull this. So I could pull down this image and I could sort of CD test one. Oops, yeah, let me go in here. I could pull it down and you can see I've got OpenSUSE in here. And then if I go into OpenSUSE, I've got an index and I can see that index. And I can really dig into exactly what my container is made of. Let me make this full screen. All right. Hi, you washing your hands? <laughs> washing your hands over there. Okay, you're better than me. I don't do I don't do that enough. Okay, JQ. So if I go in here, this is my manifest. So remember we we're just talking about these manifests, right? So let's look. Let's go back. Where where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um over here, right? Here's my picture, right? So this is image index and it has these manifests, right? So you could see that here. So our image index for this just has like one, one manifest, right? And um, so this is open source. I don't know why we use that as an example. But anyway, so if I tree this, okay, you'll see that I have an index and then that, that index has this manifest. It has a digest and then it has a, an OCI layout. Let's see what's in there. OCI layout. Okay, and that doesn't have anything other than the layout version. So there's multiple different, I guess, ways that you can organize this data. And then these things are like tarballs, right? Um, I'm pretty sure they're tarballs, right? Unless they're like references. Um, two five. Let's let's see what this is. Let's check it out. Okay, ASCII text with very long lines. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know that was a type. Okay, so if I go in here. Oh yeah, this is also JSON. So I can go in here and I can cat it, type it to JQ and see what it's all about. Okay, so if I go into this individual manifests, right, then you'll see here each one of these um, has like a bunch of metadata and then ultimately the layers are all in here. And uh, thanks to, um, thanks by the way to Liz Rice, she has a cool video about this where she talks through some of this stuff that I, I looked at earlier today to kind of learn some of this. Um, and so, uh, and then I, from, from watching that video, I actually learned about this uh, tool called Umochi. And so Umochi, I don't know if that's how you say it, but so what Umochi allows you to do is like, once you've pulled these things down, then you can kind of, and you can kind of open the whole thing up and you can just have like a local assembled you know, because Docker or because OCI images have layers, right? That's why they're fast to pull down usually. But you can assemble all the layers together and then actually see on disk what they're like. So, for example, um, if I run uh, Umochi here, I, I can run that command and I can um, Umochi. Where is it? I've actually already I've actually already done an unpack of these, so I can do a emoji unpack, um, emoji unpack, and let me see. 
Jesus. Um, where is it? Yeah. Open SUSE bundle, right? So here, if I CD here, right? Oh, I you, actually, when you do this, um, when you do that, when you do that open SUSE, when you do the open SUSE bundle, when you actually, um, when you, when you wind up like digging into it, you actually have to, what's it called? Uh, what's the command you run? You have to sudo it. And so it makes like a, it makes a, um, bundle two, I guess I'll call this. Uh, what was our open SUSE version that we got? Um, forty-two dot two. Oh, first we have to Scopio it, right? So, Scopio four dot forty-two. Oh, I guess we called it latest. Is that what we did? I might have the wrong. Okay, here we go. So now it's unpacking it. So there we go. So now I've got it all in a bundle, and so now I can. I have to be root to do this sudo su. Um, I can cd into that bundle, and I've pulled down the the image, the Docker image, from the internet with Scopio, and now I can see. I can really like kind of get into it, right? So I can go and I can open up vim vim dot, and I could go in here and I can look into the root file system, and now I can see every single thing in that container image, right? Without having to run it or anything else, right? And so that's like a really nice, powerful tool for really looking at exactly what's inside of your images, right? And um, and then you can see in here, it actually, I also have all the defaults. So this is kind of like what normally you would use Docker to do. But the reason all this stuff is important is because in Kubernetes nowadays, you don't have Docker and you don't have all those nice command line, like expectations from your from your command line, uh, from your driver anymore, because you're using container D, which is much lighter weight. So tools like Scopio and Umochi and stuff, what you do is you kind of use those tools to in investigate and inspect your containers. Um, and those tools are much lighter weight and they can be composed much more easily like into CI jobs and things like that, right? So from an operation standpoint, it's really nice that these exist. One note is that it's not trivial to install Scopio. I found that when I was installing it, I had to um, apt get install it because it had a lot of dependencies on like file system layer libraries and stuff. And so um, I did like, I think it might be in my history somewhere, but I did something like an apt, apt get, yeah, I did this. And before doing that, I had to, trying to run it from source was tricky because I had to install this like lib GPG and all this other stuff. Yeah, dive, dive. So yeah, there, it's like a it, there's a stack, right? There's three things. There's like the Scopio, there's Dive, and I don't know what else, but there's like three different things that kind of fit into the to the to the layers here. So we can check out Dive and then jump over to images. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Dive. So. Um, Tool for exploring a Docker image, layer contents, and discovering ways to shrink the size. Yeah, so Dive is another one of these tools that you might might use. And actually, it looks like they have a demo here for us. So let's look at what they're doing in this little in this Giphy. So it looks like they're. Uh, oh man, how do I get it? Oh, right, here we go. So they they are opening up the file tree, and then they're jumping around, and they can look at every SHA for every intermediate image. And then I guess they can see the diff in the file tree. That's really cool. Through like four, that's, yeah, wow. So they can compare the file tree, I guess, at a given image, at a, diff, at a given step in the Docker build. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I'm kind of scared of, I'm scared of what I would see if I like use this on my stuff. Like, okay, so, and so you can make your make your images run, pull down a lot faster. That's really important. People talk about how it's not that important, but the reason it's important is that nowadays, like every app has like fifty microservices. So like it's like optimizing any given one image isn't a huge deal. 
But like when you're deploying an app that has 50 containers, like optimizing how those containers pull down actually is 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 super important because people are making smaller and smaller microservices nowadays. Google Crane is useful to pull an image and play with remote messages. Okay, cool. So we've got Google Crane. That's worth looking into. Um, and then we're gonna okay. That's the last one though. <laughs> Google Crane, and then we're gonna go to okay. Managing container images. Okay, and it's got all these. Okay, it's got all these tools to to dig through a repository. Yeah, and I don't know if folks use Harbor, but Harbor allows you to do a lot of this stuff. I guess has a lot of cool server side tools, by the way, too. Um, so let's go and. Um, Let's go and switch over to the, uh, this is really cool. It scans stuff and signs stuff and, you know, it's like an end to end. I think you can upload Helm charts to it. Um, I haven't done much with, with Harbor, but, you know, it's a very developer friendly Docker registry if you're in the CI business. So let's jump over to image builder. So we've talked about containers, right? So let's just to, let's just zoom out here. And let's go, let's go over here and let's make a new sort of diagram and let's talk about where we all fit. So in a cluster, in a normal cluster, here's what you have, right? You have nodes, okay? And, you know, I might have a Linux node and a Windows node and a Linux node. And maybe this is an Ubuntu node and maybe this is a Windows server node 2019 or whatever. And then maybe this is also a Linux node, but maybe this is a Linux node that has some libraries for like GPU or something, or maybe it's, man, maybe it's not Ubuntu. Maybe it's a different, just maybe it's CentOS, right? So I have these three different OSs and in a cluster, right? You might have apps that run in different places for different reasons, right? So each one of these is a kubelet. And what I want to do is I maybe want to update these images. I want to update, I want to build new versions of these images. And in order to do that, each one of these needs kubelet.exe, it needs kubeproxy.ex, or, well, the Windows one needs kube, kubelet.exe and kubeproxy.exe, but then these need the kubelet, the Linux executable and the kubeproxy executable, right? Kube, these, my writing is horrible right now. Yeah, executable, right? And then I may actually also want to put like binaries on here. Like I might want to put CNI binaries, right? Like say I'm running Antria right? Um, uh, it's like, say I'm running Antria. So then each one of these here, I'd want a different, I'd want Antria agent. And then here, maybe I'd want Antria executable, right? Same thing for Calico, right? Maybe, maybe I don't want Antria. Maybe I'm using Calico for my CI, CI. In the same situation, I need to put Calico here. I need to put the Calico executable here um, on the Windows machine. So each one of these images is totally different. And I need a way to, to build these, right? I need a I know this diagram is kind of small. I'm still, I'm kind of new to live streaming, so I don't make my images big enough sometimes. Um, so here we go. So here's my diagram. I don't know if this is legible to y'all, but what I was trying to do was have three different nodes, node one, node two, node three, and show that like there's all this different stuff that you have to put into all these, right? So image builder, that's where image builder comes in. And so me and James are going to talk a little bit about that. So quickly, let me see. I have it. I have an image builder. I think I have a tab with this in it somewhere. Um, so yeah, here actually, I'm just playing with it. So here we go. So I can actually run, um, if I go into... If I clone down image builder from, from, this is an upstream Kubernetes repository. What this will do is image builder. If I clone it, if I clone this, this down, this is like sort of a, a Swiss army knife for building, uh, you're building your operating system, right? Building your executable, not your operating system, but building your, your, um, building your OS image so that you've got a bootable Kubernetes node, right? And so it's going to put Kube, it's going to set, it's going to set up uh, your nodes with Kub with the kubelet and um, so that they can, you know, run kubeadm join and, and like jump into a cluster and so they can bootstrap a cluster and all that other stuff. Right. Um, so the way this all like, so to see how this all works, right. Like, so, so for cluster API, this is a big thing, the idea of the golden image. Right. And, and this is not just the Kubernetes thing. This is a, like, Azure and Amazon and every cloud has some kind of image building service that allows you to build OSs 
like kind of in an immutable way, right? Um, and so, 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 but this is the upstream Kubernetes image builder that I'm that that I'm talking about right now. And um, so, if I CD here and I clone this clone this down, I can. Let me make sure there's nothing in output because I tested this out earlier. Make your font a little bit bigger. Yeah, thanks for reminding me there. Um, so, um, oh, there's nothing in there. Okay, so if I do make, I can. What I can do here is I'm running vSphere VMware Fusion here, but you don't need VMware Fusion. You can. You can make a, an OS image. I'll show you how this works. We'll, we'll go through this again, but you know you can make all, all these different. There's all these different ways to build these, right? So this is really this has been curated upstream, and you can just grab this for your for your internal systems or whatever. If your boss tells you they want you to preload all of your Kubernetes stuff on there so that VMs start up a lot faster and whatnot, you can make these, and then you can. Um, so we've got all these different things, and you can. You can run these in Azure. You can run. You can so you can build Azure images. You can build um, AMIs. You can build. Um, you can build build OVAs, and that's what we do for at, here at VMware, right? We want to build OVAs, and and if you want to build an OVA, there's actually two ways to do it. You can actually build it on vSphere, or you can build it locally. So if you build it locally, you still need a hypervisor to spin up a VM and do some stuff to it um, before spinning the VM down. So. Um, but if you do local, what it does is it will use VMware Fusion and um, it will like fire up a Fusion instance, as you can see here. And um, what's happening now is it's going to fire this Fusion instance up. And in this case, I'm using Image Builder to actually build a Windows kubelet. Okay. And so that's where, so, so in order to do this, we need to actually pull down all these bits from different places. And so one of the things that we have inside of Image Builder now is the ability to, um, we have a tiny little Golang web server that you can run. It's just, it's more like a script than anything else that um, that, 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 that allows you to uh, sort of serve the, um, uh, yeah. To, that allows you to serve this stuff up. And so as an example, what we do is we, we run this and, um, oh, that's the wrong, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's not it. Um, I don't actually have that on me, but anyways, as you can see, I'm spinning up a Windows VM here. And now what's happening is Image Builder is running a bunch of commands against that VM. Um, to set stuff up. And I'm not going to run this whole thing because it takes a while. But um, what it's doing is it's execing in here. And um, wait, no, that's not it. That's the wrong. Where is my process? It's a totally different process. Where is it? Here it is. It's executing in here. And um, right now it's, it's waiting for WinRM to come up. It's going to use WinRM to... Uh, it's going to use WinRM to like run a bunch of remote commands on this VM. Uh, as you can see here, it is. It's copying stuff over. The OS is booting up now. And then if I was to let this run all day or whatever, however long it takes, like it usually takes like half hour, <laughs> it would eventually pull down stuff from the internet. And um, like after pulling that stuff down, it would like, um, let's see, where did it go? Here it is. Yeah, after pulling all this stuff down, um, it would then uh, sort of clean up the image and delete all the art installation artifacts that it needed during the time and prep the image to be like a production ready generic node and everything else. Um, and then this node could be used to as a kubelet, right? So I could just mount this into my hypervisor, whatever it was, was a vSphere or whatever, and, um, and start it up. And as long as I put some basic information into its cloud in it, um, it would be able to find the um, kubelet. So it would be able to find the API server and kubeadm join to it. So this is image builder. And now, the, but this is more like from my perspective, the VMware perspective, James is going to kind of show you how he looks at this whole story. I'm going to kill this because I'm assuming you don't want to wait for the this 100% thing to happen. So, so this is the whole thing that winds up happening. And um, 
if we had built the whole OVA, then we could actually untar it and look inside of it because an OVA is just like a big tar GZ file. Um, now, James, um, cool. so there's, yeah, the VHD stuff. You want to <laughs> you want to introduce them to that whole thing. I'll, I'll share your screen. Yeah, Should I turn your screen on? How much time do we have here? Just two we minutes? have plenty of as much time as we have. Uh, we can we can okay. keep going. We usually go an hour and a half. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let me How see if I, I can share my screen. Oh, you already sh you've got me all set up. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. There we cool. go. Okay. Cool. I was already yeah. sharing my screen. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. So um, I thought we'd just kind of show you the the code base quick. Just uh, when you first enter like image builder, it can be pretty challenging to kind of figure out where you are. The code base itself um, has actually three different tools in it. So there's the image builder for cluster API, and that's the one that Jay was just talking about. And then there's a couple other tools here for other types of configuration, which I won't go into. Um, but finding just the image builder for uh, the cluster API, and um, they, they say it's for cluster API, but it really what it does is it creates a, a VM image, and this is for Linux or Windows. It creates the, um, the, the base OS image, um, and it basically preps it so that you can run kubeadm against it. Um, and so uh, I just thought I'd quickly show you kind of what this looks like. Um, so if we go in here, um, it's underneath this images folder, um, and then cappy. And in here, there's the make file. So that was the when Jay kind of showed, hey, make this. This is where we wire everything up for, for uh, setting everything up. Um, and here, uh, the way it's the way it works is it uses Packer to do the VM creation across all the different platforms. So AMI, uh, Azure, GPE, VMware, um, all of those things. And so in here, you're going to find all of the different um, configurations for each of those different uh, solutions. So I I'm most familiar with Azure, but they're all pretty similar. Um, in here, we have a Packer win Windows file. Um, and if you're familiar with Packer, it kind of provides these builders, um, different types of builders, and you can wire them up with different information. Um, and then there's provisioners down at the at the bottom here. And this is where we we tell it to run Ansible and configure everything together. Uh, and then uh, we also run um, some some testing. So if you haven't seen um, Goss before, Goss is a pretty cool tool for let's see, um, doing like server validation. I think they also have a nice little GIF here, which is pretty cool. Um, it, you run Goss Validate and you give it some uh, file that says like, I want these uh, system services running. I want these um, Goss Validate and it will go make sure everything's in the right places for those servers. So, so we have that wired up for uh, the Linux VMs and the the Windows VM, so that, that makes sure that um, you know kubelets in the right place and configured properly um, has all the kubeadms there. It's the right version of kubeadm, so that we're, we're confident that our uh, VHD that we're or the image the um, the VM image that we're we're generating that we're going to use across our entire cluster uh, is 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 exactly what we expected. So. Uh, we wire all that in um, and and run the Goss test against it. Um, and then, so, so that's where kind of Packer is. And you can see you've got the AMIs and they all look pretty similar. Um, so oops, let's see. Yeah, so so they've got the builders and uh, Packer gives you a bunch of different builders across the, the solution here. Uh, and then um, the other thing that's in here is the Ansible. So, uh, to do all the configuration, we, we do that all through Ansible. And in the roles, we can see um, there's, uh, we install container D, we've got uh, like all the different Kubernetes components. So if we look in here, we'll see, um, this is where we pull down kubeadm, make sure that we preload any images. Um, let's see, what else is interesting oh, in here? But by the way, so I really Suresh's question is kind of oh I missed the that. big Thank you. the big elephant in the room here, right? So, do, do you have a cluster API bootstrap example? If not, I have one. I can link you to it. <laughs> uh, so, what was the question? 
He asked what's the how init process? You, yeah. What's init? Yeah. The init process. So we're actually using uh, cloud-based init. So um, this is a tool uh, that is in cross-platform version of cloud init. Uh, it was it's developed by um, Cloudbase, and it has the same type of interface. So it has the user data. So just uh, it, it kind of implements all the same user interfaces that you would see um, in Cloud Init. So here you can see I can write different files into different locations, and then there's a run command, which is the one that we use to do kubeadm. Yep. So, so here we can do it in Windows, or we can do it with Linux. Um, and so, on the Linux side in cluster uh, cluster API, at least for Azure, we use you know Cloud Init, and then for Windows, we use Cloud Base Init. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So that whole you know we do a lot of stuff in the kubeadm join because um, you can you can have like post join stuff that you do. So in in cluster API, we do a lot of uh, tricks inside um, the kubeadm join configuration so that like after you know it's a kube, it's called like a kubeadm post what is it called a kubeadm post post kubeadm command and you know in the in the post kubeadm command that's when what we we install antria agent.exe so Suresh the big thing to think of is this like if you're booting a windows node like you're booting a linux node you're going to run your cni in a container you're booting a Windows node, you do kubeadm join, um, and you join the cluster, and that's like a Windows executable step, and it's very similar to the Linux side of things. But then after that, it's totally different, and the initialization might use NSSM to run certain services, for example, to run your CNI, right? Or to run CSI proxy, which allows you to do CSI on Windows, um, because there's no privileged containers on Windows. So you kind of have to do, you said systemd, and, and that's your kind of exactly right there, right? You need to use like NSSM, which is a Windows systemd-like thing to sort of start services up. One thing to note though, is that certain executables like Containerd, when you install them, that is a Golang program, but it's capable of installing itself as a Windows service, which is cool. And the kubelet does that too, right, James? The yes. Kubelet, yep. kubelet so self-installs. Yeah, so some of the Windows services self-install themselves as Windows services. Um, in so they're kind of like system D ish in that sense, right? They have the same sort of like, they just work. Um, but other things like Antria and Calico and things you might want to run, they don't have that functionality embedded in them. And so, yeah, NSSM, yeah, NSSM. Yeah. So what you do is you wrap those in NSSM and that will start those services for you. So there's kind of a, a weird set of post kubeadm bootstrap steps that you have to do. And there's a lot of ways to do it, but the 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 key thing, the key two ways, kind of I think, are you can write some GoLang code, you know, or it, to to literally self-install yourself as a as a native Windows service, and that's not too hard to do. And you can look in the Containerd code base for an example of that. There's also a PR from my friend um, Sladen, uh, who's who's actually trying to put that into. Um, put this into Antria so that Antria self-installs itself as a Windows service. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Dave. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, there it is. Actually, James is pulling it up. Yeah, I was just thought I'd pull it up. This is where uh, Containerd actually registers it itself as a service. So it calls, uh, so it adds a flag. And then if we go, here, I think this is where, oh, that's going down into the actual service creation, but um, yeah, you just pass it some extra flags and it will actually register it itself as a, um, a Windows service. And so you, you yeah. can go like uh, look at the services in Windows and you'll see Containerd or uh, Kubelet or any of them running in there. Oh, yeah. And thanks for the, thanks for the shout out, Dave. You know, sometimes we get we feel like nobody loves us in the Windows world, so we love to hear that. Okay, so <laughs> um, great. Uh, yes. So, yeah. I, I, so, so you've got Packer, and then you've got Ansible, and then they, we provide um, in Cluster API. We provide quite a few like configurations out of the box. You just 
you know, you can just, as you saw, you just run that make make command and it'll spin up and it'll install the latest versions of everything and make sure it's all wired together. But um, oftentimes you need to be able to um, uh, customize these things. So the, the way that you typically do that is you um, create a, a custom JSON and then you can provide additional information. So um, right now I'm working on uh, adding host process support uh, and I need a custom binary to to do that for for the windows so uh with, with the it gives you these different lists to be able to pull different binaries and so here i just configure it to pull this extra binary that isn't you know cluster api or um image builder doesn't know anything about it but um I, I can tell it to go pull it and then i can go tell it to stick it into the container d folder or any folder and this works for windows or linux um and it works the same way uh and then the the way that you end up using that. So you can kind of write your own packages and you can just say packer extra bars and you can customize this thing down to, you know, the versions, um, extra images that you want to pre-pull onto the, to the VM so that, you know, when, when a container starts, it doesn't have to go and pull, it just starts up. Um, and, and you just, you can export it through these extra files like that. So um, it's pretty cool to uh, be able to, you know, customize it and take, you know what the community has given you um, out of the box, and then you know add all those little bells and whistles, or, or removing some things if you need to. So, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so you're right there in that burrito area. Do you want to show them the hack script that we use and and in the upstream, and then I can I can show them the what it actually looks like. You know, in terms of when you actually sort of extend it, because. You know, the, the thing that's really you want to do with Windows images is you want to build them yourself because it's illegal to distribute it. So you have to build them yourself. And and so like what James was just showing there is like, you know, we put these download links here so that you can build your own images. So you could just like run this script, for example, and extend it, hack it up so that you you could serve up your own local artifacts of whatever you wanted. And then Image Builder could just pull those down locally. Right, and you, you you saw the workflow earlier when I ran that command, right? So the only difference is I would go edit those that JSON file that that was just that uh, James was showing, and and so that it um, pulled the um, kublet.exe and all these different things from um, from from the IP address of where I was running this process at, and then this process would be running from a directory that had all my Kubernetes executables in it, and then they would pull down those executables. So that's how a vendor packages Kubernetes for Windows, right? Um, and for Linux, for that matter, you have to, you could do the same story, right? You have your own executables living somewhere, and you pull them down somehow uh, into the images. Yeah, so this is just a little script that you wrote to, to be able to host those binaries locally for yourself, right? Yeah, this is a, exactly, yeah. So so um, if I have a AVI, let's see if I have a running implementation of it somewhere. Might even get to. Yeah, yeah, so here we go. So I will quickly share my thing again, and I'm going to give it back to you after that, James, just so I can show him this. Um, so you could see here, like, um, what we do is, you know, I can run this container and I call it burrito. And I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if James calls his, his things. I don't know if he calls his things that host all the crew, all the Kubernetes artifacts burritos, but that's what I call mine. And so I have my burrito over here and it's got, um, I don't know why my screen is, like frozen here, but yeah, it's uh, it's got all these artifacts in it. So like when I was to run image builder, right? What I do is I'll just literally take the IP address of this and replace that subway string right there with the IP address and then run that packer.json pointing to this IP. And then I'm going to get in the installation process, I'm gonna get these 1.20.6 binaries instead of whatever the defaults are that image builder is pulling down. So that's how we, for example, downstream, that's how we, we extend that script to do this um, for our customers. Um, okay, cool. So now I'm back to you, James. I don't know how I, there we go. Oh God, I just moved you from the stream on accident. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Here you go. Okay, you're back again. Okay. Uh, so I think there was a question on docs on how to uh, bootstrap a cluster locally using Image Builder. So well, um, well Ricardo asked some... if we can have image layers for free BSD, but I think he's <laughs> kind of making fun of us. I'm not sure he's. <laughs> Anyways, go on. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I didn't see that one. I was looking at uh, YMOs. Comment okay. There. YMO. Yeah. There are some docs for Image Builder specifically. Um, the the images that that they are designed and typically used in uh, a, like a cluster API provider's uh, component. So in Azure, the way that we bootstrap them is using Cloud Init, and you just pass that data to the Cloud Init, and um, there's a command. You just it's basically the kube adm join command that gets passed to um, the cloud in it, and then that knows how to boot the VM and, and join the cluster via kube ADM. Um, if you build one of these images, uh, it will come ready, and you all you need to do is log into the VM and run a kube ADM command. So um, if you wanted to do it that way, you could um, do it manually. So that, that's how I actually test these things, like these images, with when I'm not working inside cluster API. Um, I just remote into the VM itself. And then um, do I go to my uh, control plane node, get a kubeadm join token, and then uh, run it right on the VM itself, and, and it'll join the, the, the cluster. So um, you can you, you basically follow the same exact docs um, that are in upstream uh, on how to do kubeadm joins. It's just that all the components and everything is placed into the right places and wired up properly for you to just run that command. So that that and that's essentially what cl uh, cluster API does uh, to to join a new node new node when you're when you're running it. So yeah, I'm uh, pointing him to Friedrich stuff because I think for folks that have never thought about this stuff before, um, you know, the reason this is important is it takes a long time for a for a node to install all this stuff, and you have to pull a bunch of stuff down and. And um, so if you want to like go through that experience manually, just to understand why image builder exists, we have for us a multi OS kube, kube recipe that we're curating over at SIG windows. And I put the link to it in the YouTube chat there, but it's like, um, you know, you, you vagrant up and then it goes and it downloads all the stuff you need and it installs it and it'll start a windows node and it'll start a Linux node and it'll join them up together and so on and so forth for you. And so you could see that and you could be like, okay, now I could see why I might want something like image builder to streamline this whole thing so that my whole bringing up a cluster is a totally decoupled thing from the whole installing stuff on the nodes that live on the cluster that I already know I'm going to need. Right? Like, you know, you don't want to install SSH from the internet every time you, <laughs> every time you have to add a new node to your cluster. Right. Especially because I don't know why, but like, Lately, we've been finding that SSH installation fails like twenty percent of the time in some of our some of our image builder runs. So, um, but maybe our friends at Microsoft can figure that out for us at some point. Um, yeah, we're, <laughs> Harry recorded that this morning, so <laughs> so yeah. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah, so keep going. I just wanted to show them that. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, I was just looking to see if I could find the kubeadm like uh, command. Uh, for the cloud in it so that you can see kind of what, yeah. So this is the kubeadm bootstrap script. Um, it's basically, uh, uh, this is what kubeadm in, or cluster API injects into um, the cloud in it for, for new, new VMs joining. Um, and so you can see there's some retry logic and things in here, but um, the, where is it? Somewhere in here, you can see it's they they um, they go get the kubeadm commands and then they just that's basically the only command that's inside the the cloud in it. Um, there's a bunch of retries and other things in there, but beyond that, that's that's how you join the the node. It's there's not too much uh, happening um, behind the scenes beyond that. So uh, yeah, just thought I'd show that there. Um, um, yeah, cool. Yeah, I, 
I, I think that was kind of everything I wanted to show. I don't know if there's any questions or anything else that folks want to see. I, I do have a VM that I could we could kind of poke around and see what actually was created if that's that's interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah I mean if you if you if you have one and you want to open it up, unless anybody has anything better to do, go for it. Yeah, give me just a second to see. So while you're opening that up, um, me and James were talking about this earlier and we both realized we needed to Google what an OVA and an OVF and all that stuff were. Um, and I put a link in the thing in the notes here about how all this stuff is works, but there's OVA. Oh, wait, did I lose you? Do I need to add you again? Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah. The OVA is, um, this guy has a post about it. What is it? Um, spin.atomicobject.com. Yeah, that. And so there's there's OVF, there's OVA. That's what we were kind of talking about. The OVF is the specification. Um, it's an XML file. So you'll, you know, if you open up one of these things, you can tar dash, you can tar, you can untar a OVA file. And inside of it, you'll get this OVF, which is this XML file that describes the format of the, of the, uh, of the, you know, the machine that's read by your hypervisor when it's starting the VM up and all that. And then the OVA is the thing that like packages that metadata along with all the disk images and everything else that got made. So James is inside of one of those now, so he can show you more. Yeah. So this is one of the VMs. This is a Windows VM um, that was created, but uh, it essentially does the same stuff. So uh, by convention, created, I don't, I don't know who did this. By, but... Wait, <laughs> created by who? By you? Yeah, this I so I created this using Image Builder. Image Builder, um, okay. So it's a Kubelet yep. VM. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so we can see that there's a bunch of different things on here. And by convention, I'm not sure who created this convention, but um, the K folder is where like all the Kubelet and other KubeADM and all those things land. So we can see that um, here we've got uh, kubectl, we've got Kubelet, we've got NSSM. Um, there's some additional bootstrap stuff that we put um, in a PowerShell script for, for Windows. Uh, but then we also have um, Image Builder. By default, we kind of drop a bunch of like helper scripts for debugging uh, different components on um, on Windows. So this collect you can run collect logs, and it um, will run through and collect a bunch of information that you can then ship off to somebody to kind of investigate it. Um, that looks like there is something with that PS, uh, PS file, but um, yeah, so it runs there. Um, so what we could actually do is um, do a kubeadm join here. If, if I had the control plane nodes up, I could actually just run a kubeadm join and we'd see that this, this cluster was actually joined to the cluster. Um, uh, the other thing that we have in here is um, the, uh, if I go into temp, and here is where all the GOSS stuff is. So this, this, these are those GOSS specs that I was talking about before. If I do GOSS spec, um, here we can see um, these are. This is we're saying uh, we want a Windows service that uh, is called Kubelet, and we want to make sure that that, that service is, is exists, um, and um, we uh, make sure that it's. Um, got the right required services. Uh, so here we're also we've also installed the SSH. We want to make sure that service is running. Um, down here we want to make sure the right kubeadm version is is in is running in here. Um, and so uh, then from there, um, if I oh, no, I'm not. I thought I had the uh, kube uh, the gos command, but I can run gos and it will actually validate against all those fields. And say that yeah, we've got all these things in the right place, which is which is pretty cool. Um, I think uh, the other thing that I could show is in here if I go to um, our logs. This is where the Kubelet logs are. So Kubelet uh, hasn't run, but um, uh, the the logs would be in here. So um, yeah, kind of uh, you can see everything's been all set up and configured properly. So that this thing is ready to uh, join a cluster and, and, and do its work. Um, I think uh, program data and 
this one's a container D system. So here's all of the container D um, folder structure and, and everything's in there. Uh, and if we did like get service container D, we'll see um, container D. Yeah. So this is for what's his name's question. I forgot. So uh, was it Suresh's question, right? Like, what do you do for the systems, right? You do get dash service and and then that's that's the equivalent of system CTL status, right? On a Windows box. Yeah. So the typical thing we do, you know, the first thing you do when you get into a Windows node is you do get service, star kube, and you look at, you know, what's there and what's not there. Yep. So Kubelet hasn't started because we're gonna have Kubeadm started up for us when it during the bootstrapping process. Yeah. So cool. That's kind of a quick look into what what's put onto it. And this uh, is a VM. VHD, right? Well, so um, the image builder generates a VHD, uh, and then you do need to run uh, a command to turn that into uh, a disk that can be used by, um, or a VM image that can be used by um, Azure. So By Azure, so, okay. Yeah. So what is a VHD? VHD is like, yeah. uh, I think it's the file system that des describes like the virtual file system for Hyper-V container, uh, Hyper-V VMs. Virtual so machines, it's got okay. all the all the information and the file layout and everything in there. Um, okay. Yep. Does Azure run on Hyper-V or what does it run on? Or are you allowed to say? I don't even I, know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think it's Hyper-V. I don't know exactly um, Okay. what's underneath it what's under the hood but yeah okay so i don't want to get you like in trouble so okay cool yeah. <laughs> um yeah all right so i mean that's it like that's everything like i mean that's everything now i mean we've got usually we go an hour and a half when i do this does anybody want to like dive in anything else like we didn't I, I i don't i can't think of anything i showed everybody the file tree for a container right we we did that did we do that i don't even remember anymore we dug into that right and um we did, we got to look at VMs. We got to look at the, the, so we got to look at the OVAs and the VHDs that are actually the currency of the kublets and the, and the API servers and all that stuff that are actually running in a real cluster and those that get made. And then we got to look at the AGN host. We looked at that and the, um, and, and the pause container, which are both kind of, you know, used for internal Kubernetes development, but are pretty good analogs to what happens in the real world. If you wanted to build a multi-arch image, um, and I mean, I think that's probably, I think that's probably most of what we wanted to dig into. And, um, if you want to learn more about this, the best places to look at, look at the pause image. It's a great example of how to build a multi-architecture container image. And, um, you can look at the make file for that in upstream K eights. You can look at, um, the image builder code base. If you want to look at how you can build your own homegrown, um, I want to create my own operating system images um, for, for Kubernetes. Um, and you can use that to build Windows or Linux images. Um, uh, I don't know what else we were going to go through, but I feel like we feel like we kind of hit everything, right? Yeah, we covered a lot. <laughs> okay. We covered a lot of ground there. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, I think that that's, I think, I think that's, I think that's, that's, uh, that's going to be, that's going to be it for today then. So, um, so thanks, David, for all your thanks, David and Suresh and everybody else for all your questions. Ricardo, Ricardo's here. If Ricardo had a question about B, uh, BSD, he he actually was working on trying to port Kube over to, to <laughs> actually build BSD support in. So Ricardo, before we sign off, do you want to like sort of <laughs> tell us <laughs> how that all went and where that ended up? Yeah, I, I've ju I've just joined it ju just to, to explain. Uh, we've we've been trying to make uh, Kubelet run with with FreeBSD jails. So Jay asked me about the images as well. I've, I've been trying to work on something like that because I, I don't know if few folks know about how jails works, but actually it's <clears throat> we can say that's a pre, pre, that was like a, a, an implementation of con containers of FreeBSD. And but when you when you use that image in, in in FreeBSD, you need to bootstrap everything like a new kernel image and a new base image. 
And what we've been trying to do, actually I'm pretty freeze now, but I wanna I wanna try again, is that you you might download that base image, which is every time the same for FreeBSD. And then over those images, put layers like I want to run an Apache or I want to run a PHP, PHP FPM or something like that. So FreeBSD works mostly this way. And hopefully by the end of the year, I can have something at least fun. There, there is some work also from the OCI folks, I guess, trying to port as well the run C and calling it run J to run. So oh really? So I, yeah. know, I know you have this, right? What is this all about? You were working on this. I know this. Yeah, I, I've started to work in a virtual kubelet, which you can simulate a kubelet in FreeBSD, and then it it watches the pods that it needs to run into the hosts. Uh, yeah, you you got it right. So, but I but I have stopped it, like because I didn't. I didn't get got yet how to deal with the networking thing and the storage thing. Just basic stuff, just yeah, yeah, yeah. things that we don't need. I'm just kidding. Yeah, cool. Okay, so so yeah, like I mean, I you know, and this is like you know, we're laughing and everything, but like this stuff is important because you know why this is really cool stuff to dig into is because it gives you a break from thinking about things in the conventional way, and it, it gives you time to really understand the internals of how Kubernetes works what it means to create a cluster, what the APIs actually represent, what it means to create a CNI provider. I didn't really understand what CNI was until I tried to get it working on Windows, you know, um, and then failed. And um, so like, you know, it, that's, it really shows you what the actual interface is between, between, between the implementation of Kubernetes that you're that you're that you're using and and what kubernetes itself is right and there's no you can't put that into words the only way you can only experience it so i would encourage everybody here to try to run a mixed operating system kubernetes distribution at some point yeah um at some at some point do something like what ricardo did or try to run windows or whatever you want but it's it's you'll you'll learn so much in such a short period of time you can, okay. you can run you can run CNI you can you can create a, a shell script that simulates a CNI and you like it's because CNI after all is just Kubelet calling another program and asking hey allocate an IP address so we, we can we can do that some some in some future Jay like programming yeah. our own CNI yeah there's and there's definitely YouTube talks out there that have done this so if you look for you know, building a CNI from scratch and stuff. You could do that. We could do that on TGI cave sometime. So if y'all want us to do that, let us know. Um, and, uh, leave some comments on this live stream video or whatever. And, uh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. If, if you enjoyed this, don't forget to like, and subscribe. I've never said that before. It's just my first time to ever <laughs> say it, but like I hear it all the time. So yeah. Um, okay. Thanks, thanks, thanks everybody for, <laughs> for coming. All right. See you, Ricardo. See you, James. See you, folks. See you.